It's loading. Are you still with me? Yeah. All right. Okay. We are live. Here it goes. We made it. I'm just going to check on the site if we are live for sure. Yes, we are live. Okay. Welcome everyone to our first Facebook Live Women in the Art of Film series. I am so excited to be joined by the amazing Chloe Weaver Bennett, um, a cinematography in the Hollywood industry. Uh, real quick, I'm gonna give you a quick bio of Chloe. She has shot as a cinematographer for shows like Chef's Table and American Vandal, and she personally shot my film, Americanish. Um, she works regularly on camera teams for like over 100 TV shows, including Dead to Me, True Detective, The Big Bang Theory, and Two and a Half Men. So to start, I would like to let everyone know that Facebook Live has a 25 second lag. So if you guys have questions, I will see them 25 seconds later, and then we will answer them 25 seconds later. But please, please, please ask questions. We'd love to hear them, and Chloe would love to answer them. So to start off, um, Chloe, tell us about your background and how you became, um, became a cinematographer. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Chloe Weaver, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, I met Nan uh, by virtue of our friend Julie Hox and got to shoot her feature film uh, over the course of two years. Uh, we've, <laughs> we've become very dear friends, so it's lovely to be here with you. Uh, so my journey, I'm going to take you back to the beginning, which um, was in high school. I was a, I'm from a very, very small town in California called Yonville. Yonville is a mile long. There's nothing to do there. It's very small. It's all about restaurants and hotels. And I just lived there. And my dad works in the wine industry. And so that's why my family was there. And um, I was a photography student in, in high school. That had my interest beyond any other thing. And I knew that I loved compositions and I, I loved taking photos and just like the handheld camera and looking through a lens was like really appealing to me. So um, there was a TV show on in that era. I was in high school in the late 90s and early 2000s, just for context. There was a show on television called The Tom Green Show, which was a really um, silly show, um, not for everyone, but it essentially was a goofball host who would do these like um, handheld camera kind of tricks and gags on the street. And this man had a TV show and he would have these like little home produced videos. And I felt like I could make that. I could make that here in my small town. I could make it just as good as Tom Green. And so I would, I like adopted my family's camcorder and started making movies that I thought were kind of like along the lines of these like antics of Tom Green where I'd go down to the supermarket and I'd, you know, strum the guitar, making up songs about the people coming inside. And like, that was funny to me at the time. And so it was just kind of my first experience of like grabbing a camera and making my own content. And it was all inspired because of this silly man making very bad uh, TV, but it inspired me nonetheless. So that was the first thing I did. Stupid videos in my town. And I graduated into making um, more cinematic movies with titles where I would cast my friends and, you know, I would be the person behind the camera because, of course, I'm interested in the composition of things and the editing and like what shots go together to tell a story. And so I made some movies in high school. One called Cheese Quest, one called <laughs> Aliens. One, you know, they're terrible, but they had plots. Not that we'd like write out dialogue, but we would record dialogue and they would edit together like a movie as opposed to like a trick on the street type of thing. So um, that was happening. I had all this content and my mother gave me an, uh, a laptop to edit on and I fell in love with the assembling of this movie, right? So adding music in iMovie to something you shot was like the most magical thing I'd ever experienced. And like the way you're transported when a song is playing over like a montage that you've shot, it felt so satisfying to me. So I was inspired by filmmakers like Wes, Wes Anderson at the time, which like in the early 2000s was like just such a new and amazing concept. Like 
this man's style stood out so much to young people. And so I like adopted things that I thought were very Wes Anderson, you know, like symmetrical compositions and character intros that are like very specific. And so I felt like I was like a little amateur Wes Anderson, like trying to make something of that quality. Um, I remember kind of like late in the summer before applying to college, I made a movie in which I played all the roles, men, women, there was a baby role. I was playing all the roles <laughs> and uh, it's terrible. And it's the one that I somehow deleted, like no one will ever see it, which is probably for the best. But um, I felt like I had made amazing strides and I was like this up and coming Wes Anderson. So that places me at the end of high school. It's time to apply for colleges. I've got like a 3.8 GPA, like I'm doing okay, but I apply to state schools all in California. I try to get away from home, but not too far. So I end up going to Long Beach State. Uh, Long Beach is just south of Los Angeles. I don't think of that as a tactic whatsoever. I just kind of like arbitrarily go to Long Beach State uh, where they help, where they have a film program. So um, of course, when you get started in college, you're not, you know, you're working on your general ed and you're not doing what you want. So you kind of like have to get through all that mess. And then suddenly I landed in the film program and I was like, my eyes were open to this like new experience of like what it actually meant to maybe be a filmmaker. I didn't know the word cinematography. I didn't know anything about it. All I understood about myself is that I liked uh, camera work, like operating. And then I liked editing, I thought, you know? So um, <clears throat> I ended up being like a pretty timid student. I just felt like everyone knew more than me. I was way too embarrassed to share any of the work I had ever done prior. Like I wasn't gonna show anyone my Cheese Quest movie. That was for me only. And so I ended up kind of being someone who watched from the sidelines as a lot of people like, would engage in the roles that I knew that I actually wanted to do, but I was just too timid. So I would do things like hold the boom mic. I would PA, I would like produce on a really low level and I would still get myself on set, but I knew that I hadn't like quite chased it hard enough. I wasn't in the camera department where I wanted to be. So it wasn't until I was actually graduating from college with a film degree in which I studied mostly theory classes because like I said, I was being very timid. Um, I hadn't taken a single cinematography course. I'd taken directing, but you know, hadn't done much with that. Dipped my toe in editing, but I was just like a nervous person. And um, it wasn't until the summer after I had actually graduated that someone, a, a director of photography who had been like a kind of early star in our in our college in that role he was going to shoot a movie using all students an all student cast and crew that summer and we had become friends and he actually asked me what do you really want to do and it was the first time that i had like had that opportunity and i just told him i want to do camera work and he told me about this role that is like the focus puller the first ac this is a this is a role in the camera department right below the camera operator they kind of are like the camera technician they know everything about the camera they care for it if the camera is going to move from here to here it's the camera assistant that will do it it's like this very technical job and so i eagerly take that role not knowing whatsoever really what that meant but i knew that this person this man matt he would teach me enough to like not ruin his movie so so that summer, I was like a newly graduated college student. I worked on this movie. We slept in the director's um, living room for over a month. And it was like far away from my house. So it'd be like this long drive. We'd get there on Monday, we'd shoot Monday, sleep on the, on the floor in the living room, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through Friday, and then go home on the weekends. And like, that was my first like, oh my God, we're, we're making a movie and I'm in the camera department. And I was like, my life was just like set from there on. I found, you know, this thing that I was good at that interests me, that engaged me. It was like about leadership, but it was about like camera technical things. And I was just like, I found my, I found my thing. That's amazing. What a great journey oh, yeah. story. 
that was a great journey story. And I cannot believe Tom Green is what motivated you to become a filmmaker. Girl, girl you could talk to Tom Green now, like, hey, Tom Green, look what's going on. And where's Tom I mean, Green? I mean, yeah, I don't admit that Tom Green thing to everybody, but like, you just fact. admitted it to the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he got me, he got me to where I was, I guess, in some weird way. And of course, Wes Anderson. I tell every single student, please stop trying to be some Wes Anderson. I mean, we get it. <laughs> it's, it's really great. That's so. Yeah. So, um, film is really like a mentorship game, like going into the industry. And um, do you find that to be super important? And if so, who are your mentors that help you get into the industry? I do think it's important. I think it's probably the most important thing about it. I mean, my first mentor was this person, Matt this person that gave me this role in the camera department that I really wanted. And, and Matt was just a student. He was just a friend. And, and his father is a cinematographer. He's an ASC cinematographer, which is like a very prestigious position amongst cinematographers of the world. So like he had this early exposure being on set. Like when he was eight years old, he was like slating on the set of Dumb and Dumber and like his father shot all these movies. So he was like the standout person in my college that I got to be close to and learn from. And uh, he was my first mentor without a doubt. And then and it kind of like around that same time period, um, a teacher at Cal State Long Beach had introduced us to another working professional. And this is like the benefit of going to school, right? It's like your teachers are in theory working and knowing people in the industry themselves. And this, per this teacher introduced me to another working um, director of photography and I became his camera assistant. Now granted, he always needed free work. Like I was helping him out a lot by being this free student, but like that only lasted a few jobs. I proved myself and then I became his like paid camera assistant. And it happened that fast, you know? Mm -hmm. It was just like, at first you're doing a favor until so you've proven yourself, and now you're just a crew member. And that relationship with this, this gentleman named Michael Franks is um, still going on today. Mm. He, he's still shooting, and I'll come, now I'm not his camera assistant, but I'll come operate a camera from him. You know, like, well, just our, our relationship has just continued to, to graduate as we both graduate into better and better roles. Those were really early, early, early mentors. And then there's been more, um, I think one more to talk about. Um, so briefly to, to describe what I did for nine years as a camera assistant, I was a focus puller. And it's a really um, technical job where you're behind the camera and you're literally adjusting the lens. Uh, this is always a challenge to describe, but um, as an actor approaches a camera, their distance to the camera changes. And if you don't move the focus barrel, they go out of focus. So it's this important job where you're, you're literally, you're, you're supposed to keep the shot in focus. And by doing that, you need to have this technical knowledge of distance and like how cameras work and depth of field. And anyway, um, so I did that job for nine years and, and you leave the camera department. There's all kinds of assets to the job, but there's also this main technical job where if you fail at it, it's very tragic because you've ruined the whole performance. And I can tell you of some stories of some performances that I've ruined over the years, <laughs> including some things with Nicole Kidman that I feel very ashamed of, but it's just a hard job. And so when I was getting into that, um, it was really important to find some people that were really excellent at it because it's very intimidating and it's kind of a job that you don't notice until it goes really poorly. And so I met this gentleman named Steve Cueva and, um, Steve is just like a hot shot in, he's, he's, he's done the same, uh, his trajectory is just the same as mine where he was like a little, uh, a little, um, hip squeak on the on the film crew and graduated from position to position now he's a focus puller but he works on like the biggest movies that you can possibly be, 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 a, be a part of and so he's obviously very good at his job and there's a lot of money that he's in control of when he's organizing camera departments for marvel movies and so on and so i ended up having a friendship with him and he kind of taught me like how the big dogs do that role and that was like a pivotal moment for me too, because it instilled so much confidence that I could operate on a level, like a truly professional level. And that took me kind of out of like the student film zone and into like 
actual professional work. Right. So now you have been nine years as a focus puller. And then what pushed you into being coming a cinematographer? Yes. Okay. So that's a little story as well. So, um, I, I got a, I got invited to be on the crew of this traveling food show called Chef's Table. It was a Netflix show. It was going to be the first season and we we're going to go to Australia and five other countries and, um, you know, a small crew. And I got picked, I think because I'm a good focus puller, but also because I think the whole crew was going to be men if I didn't go. You know, so I, I had this special thing to offer where I was like good at my job. And also I could break up the boy party that was going to be happening because they're on the road together for like months. Right. So uh, I was invited to join this crew. And what's beautiful is that Chef's Table has been, you know, one of the best rides of my life because it's it's lasted like seven years. But this was, you know, that long ago. And um, we were just getting started. And we didn't know what it would be. So I'm, I'm just I've agreed to travel with this group of boys and we're going to make a show for a couple months. And um, we're going to eat fine foods. We're going to go to all these countries. It's going to be this amazing new experience. And the first of its kind for me where I'm traveling for that long. And I'm also like in charge of camera gear in all these different countries. And what's that going to be like? And we have to hire some local people and, and, you know, I'll, I'll be good at managing that. So I think that's why I was invited. So anyway, I ended up being a part of that show. It ends up going very well. And three years after we've been doing it, you know, I get more and more responsibility. Now, because the crew is small, sometimes you need extra footage. So like, hey, hey, the second camera's not working. Can we send Chloe out with that? And she'll get some uh, shots of the exterior of the restaurant. Or let's send her down to like downtown uh, Melbourne. And, and she'll shoot some great stuff for, you know, the transitions of our show. And so I was like trusted with more and more shooting because this crew just we needed content and there weren't a lot of people to do it and i was like one of those qualified individuals who was also like very eager so more and more i would get these opportunities to do things like b-roll and then you know the dp had to miss a few days oh chloe will fill in she'll shoot that interview no no problem you know it was just like it was a trust thing it was like these five of us have been so close and we know what we're capable of and we're all here to support each other and so through that I got these opportunities and three years after we had gotten started, I was offered an episode of my own, which was truly an honor because at this point we're in season three of a show that actually has a great success because man, I can't tell you how many things you end up working on that no one sees. Mm -hmm. And this is a documentary and not everyone gets to see documentaries except for nowadays kind of because of shows like chef's table um people like them and follow them and netflix like has exposed this whole like new amount of shows that are are well made and cinematic but are still documentary in nature so um anyway the day i was shooting my episode of chef's table i was shooting it i was uh nervous as hell because i'd like to make it as good as you know, these other cinematographers who have made episodes before me. And um, I just like had big, big shoes to fill. And uh, as soon as I was out and on TV, I said to myself, like, I can't ever go back to assisting. Like I have this on my resume and gosh, in the meantime, I've been trying to shoot, you know, all kinds of stuff. This is three years in the making. I've been shooting features on the side and, and little projects and like, learning to light and you know enhancing myself in other ways but this was the first thing that i could kind of vouch for as being quality and there it is on netflix and so i think i should just do this now <laughs> okay great amanda wants me to tell you she says hi even though amanda you could write it hi, in amanda. the comments that she says hi <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about this. So USC Annenberg does an inclusion report. And in 2016, 2018, the 250 top grossing films, um, they talked about women in film. And so they had producers that were 26% and editors that are 21%, directors 8%, and then cinematographers were the lowest at 4%. And then there were 0% for cinematographers of women of color. 
Why do you feel that there is less amount of women in, in the field of cinematography and how can we um, change that? I don't have, a, I don't have an amazing answer to this. Um, I think I think there's obvious reasons where just like crew people, um, it's just been so male dominated that's like it's it's literally just intimidating for a woman to be a part of it, and like they're not necessarily welcomed because it's like this amount of physical labor that like you might count a woman out of. Now I say I say that kind of skeptically because as long as I've been doing it, like our generation, I'm 35 our generation and and those younger than us i feel like we don't treat women like they're inferior in the same way as it had been happening for so many years in the industry mm -hmm. and that i feel mostly like completely embraced by my male counterparts like they've always raised me up they have not necessarily counted me out of things but i know that if you're looking at the history of film that's that is the story women have not been appreciated or given the opportunity to do these things so i mean i think that that's at the that's obviously the root of it is like the ma the men in charge wouldn't make room it's not like women weren't interested i'm sure they were um and there are stories of course of like women being you know admitted to the asc but like one woman one year and then a giant gap to the next one so i mean there's but nowadays and like the the experience that i'm having and certainly like any new film student i feel like there's so much more equal opportunity that it's it's sort of sad to dwell on these numbers that are are so are so sad you know four percent of women if 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 you want to think about that statistic you're you might prevent yourself from getting involved but I, I honestly don't think there's a single thing in the way especially now um and especially in the camera department do you think getting, it's about yeah. like we were talking about mentorship so um yeah. i know it's all about who you know and so because yeah. there's less mentorship for females and there's less females coming into the mentorship program because it, it is kind of like a boys club sometimes and i agree with you it is totally looking positive especially with the the streaming um, in a sense. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I super commend the US, like USC for doing this research because otherwise there's no way of changing it, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, you know what, I, I will say that like there's still, there's still like this thing about like my, I, I can like speak from my experience mostly, but like my experience is that I can get work in documentary film. If I want to shoot narratives, like it's harder, and I don't know why exactly that is, but I think that that's a historical thing that is just like changing so slowly. Like, why is it easier for a woman to break into documentary? I'm not sure, but that's like a lot of women cinematographers' story, their backstory, is yeah. that they started in docs and they finally like were trusted to shoot docs, and then like they had to like fight their way into doing narrative work, and like that's kind of my experience as well. Yeah, I mean. So going back to the mentorship, mentorship and also just stories. I mean, like I sought out a female cinematographer, like that was important to me as a female director and woman of color. Right. But who, because I know, and I had this in-depth conversation with our crew about this is that, do you choose someone because they're a woman or a person of color or because they're talented? Right. And it's not really about that. It's about, you know, giving the opportunities for the women that are as talented than this person, um, this, this male or person that has that's already in the industry. And so it's unfortunate though, because you have to seek it out. And I thankfully was able to seek it out through our, our friend that, that had worked with you. But in general, if you search up female cinematographers, and like I had done this when I was working on the feature, it's like almost impossible to find any that you can, you know, possibly work with or to have the um, ability to connect with. Um, so yeah, I mean, right. it's, it's just a, it's a sad but yet um, positive spin <laughs> on things happening as well. It's, it's funny, because when a student comes in, and they have like an inkling of camera, I'm like, hey, you want to be a cinematographer? <laughs> <laughs> like constantly yeah. not like yeah, we, need a, more. we need more not not like uh, amanda deary who wants to be a camera operator i guess she'll take nine years just like you because she doesn't want to be a dp and she gets upset that's, by that's it. a lot of people's story too we need good we need good women operators too yeah for sure 
Um, good and all. I mean, I think that you're really, really accurate in that uh, it's an effort right now. Like women are making the effort to hire one another. It's very important. Some places are getting the mandate to hire women. I'm okay with that. Let's do that. Let's let's have it be known that we can we can do this work and show the world. I think it's just an important step. Like uh, it doesn't bother me at all that that's the way it's going. It, a mandate to hire a woman that doesn't bother me. It's yeah. at least getting us in the door. Yeah, but sorry for Stacey Amanda. But yeah, it's um it's like a check. Um, it's like a, that's a, a huge conversation. I'm glad you said it doesn't bother you because people are like, oh, in order for us to make this movie, we have to have this amount of people of color. We have to have this amount of women. It's just like a checkbox that they're doing. And it's like, ends up being quote unquote, not respected in a way. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it feels a bit shallow, but I still think it's progress. Oh yeah. No, it's super important. I mean, if that's the way it has to be, yeah. then that's the way it has to be. I mean, that's, that's right. the way you made the way that you implement change for sure. Right. All right. So, um, well, tell me what was your best experience as a DP on a film set and why? And I know we talked about, uh, we t I know Chef's Table is one of them, but besides that. Yeah. Uh, Chef's Table cannot be denied. It's still one of the best things of my whole life, probably my whole career. Um, but I had this pretty great experience on a show called American Vandal, which is another Netflix show. And um, I worked on American Vandal season one. It was shot in Los Angeles, very convenient for me. My um, very dear friend, Adam Bricker, is the main DP as part of the show. And um, if you're not familiar with the show, it is uh, meant to look like a documentary. We want everyone who watches it to think that this is a documentary. Um, but in reality, it's like completely planned, like masterpiece of you know writing that just is made to look documentary-esque. And it's a true crime that is being investigated. Uh, the first season is about um, a vandalism at a school. Anyway, so the experience of making it had this beautiful um, blend of documentary, you want it to look like a documentary, but also cinema. You want to blow people's mind with how serious this documentary took the subject matter. Right, so it was like this cool challenge, and I had the opportunity to be the A camera operator. You say A camera when there's two cameras, which is often the case when you're making any kind of TV show. And when you're the A camera, you're kind of like the primary kind of visual composer, right? B camera follows the lead of A camera, and we're all taking um, leadership from Adam, who in this case is the DP. So. I'm the A camera operator, but I'm also the second unit DP, which I really liked the role. Um, similar to our relationship on Chef's Table where I would shoot things for him, he'd kind of like splinter me off. Um, this is like on the next level because we're making like a stylized TV show for, you know, with a narrative plot. So um, I just take it and run. And I'm taking these like really, um, if you watch the show, it's a bit juvenile and it's uh you're taking these juvenile scenarios and you're making them as dead serious as possible and i'm doing that like through my camera lens decisions and i'm kind of unsupervised over here like doing my own thing aesthetically um to add to the show and i just had a blast with that so that was season one so season two like our show has been a success we're revamping for season two everyone's friends now we all understand the, the concept of the show and we want to elevate it to the next level. And so season two, I'm like full-time VP second unit. Like Adam is there, he's shooting the A unit. I'm shooting B unit every single day. We're in Portland, Oregon, which I love, I fell in love with. I'm working with a brand new crew of people and I'm just in charge of these like uh, recreations. Um, super stylized we shoot them kind of with like a really kind of gritty almost black and white thing going on hard light anyway i'm having the time of my life because adam's over here he's not gonna let me fail because i'm still a young dp i don't feel like that much self-confidence all the time right so i have it's like this beautiful time where i have adam over here who i can always ask a question to um if it's about lighting or camera or something, but I'm also like in my own unsupervised unit, like there's not even a director. Mm. And I'm making like a lot of content for the show. It's kind of like the Chloe show. 
I don't know if everyone would agree with that because there is in fact a show director who had a lot of input, but like basically on a day-to-day -day basis, like I was just getting to make these like really cinematic kind of dark imagery, uh, a, a lot of, a lot of dolly work, a lot of just like interesting provocative images. And I was just, you know, had the, a Netflix budget and I was just having a ball and it was just, um, it was kind of the start of, I just wish I could make that show every year for the rest of my life because Aww. all those people are so wonderful mm -hmm. and the product is amazing. And I just felt like very empowered, but still under the wing of Adam. So I didn't have like all the pressure of a DP at the, t at that time, like with the whole show resting on my shoulders. But if I did well, I knew that the show would be a lot better for it. And I feel like that's the outcome that happened. Yay. So that, was, that was a good experience. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, we are 30 minutes in. So please um, go ahead in the comment section, ask any question for Chloe. There is a lag, so I'll probably be a minute behind you guys, but I will continue talking, but please, please, please ask us some questions. That's why we were doing this live. Um, so Chloe, I know like probably no one wants to answer this question publicly, but what was probably your worst or not best experience that you've had as a DP and why? Yes. I've got a very obvious one that comes to mind. So uh, before we made your movie, I made another feature film called Limerence. And uh, that was shot in Los Angeles in Venice Beach. And we shot for like 26 days or something. And um, it was this really interesting situation. Another woman um, director, she was the writer director and she was going to star in the movie. Mm. And she had three DPs, all of them who oh, wow. bailed on her all these male DPs, I don't know the story of how they bailed, I don't know their names, but um, she was kind of in a desperate spot where she was looking for a DP, and I think she was like, how about a woman? Because this is not working out with all these men, and someone had recommended me, and at the time, I was in Russia. I was on an episode of Chef's Table, and I get this email about a possible feature film, which is like, for me, my ultimate desire is to shoot a feature, and a feature just means feature length, hour and a half movie, like the way you think of a movie, a real movie, I was gonna get to the opportunity to shoot this if the interview went well. So from my bedroom in Russia, I call Tammy and I say, hey, I'm interested, like do you wanna talk about this and how I can contribute to your movie? And I did well enough, and she's you know, letting me know that the, the movie's gonna start in two weeks, which is not nearly enough time for anyone to prep a movie. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm like, okay, well, I get back from Russia in a week, how about I see you then? <laughs> and we'll just prep and we'll just make it. And so I'm gonna essentially get a week of prep, uh, and then we're gonna shoot this movie, and I'm just like, I'm amped out of my mind, and, T and Tammy's amped out of her mind. And, and so, we do it and I inherit the crew of the last DP that had been fired. There's no time to really change it. I would normally want to bring on my own people because there's something really important about having your support crew with you, like people that are invested in your success and who want to work for you. But instead I'm going to get these people that I don't know um, who seem totally qualified. I have phone conversations with them and like we all seem like we're going to be cohesive. Um, but anyway, we jump into this project together, all of us a, a little bit under prepped. Um, basically what happened is this, um, this gaffer, possibly the most important person to me, the person in charge of, of executing lighting for me, um, decides that he's just not a fan of me. Mm. He he's he's older. He's providing all the equipment. He has the a truck full of gear that he owns. So he is kind of indispensable. I can't just get rid of him because he's giving a lot of equipment to this very low budget movie. And uh, he just I'm being perfectly normal. I'm very nice person. I don't generally have problems with anyone. Um, and he's just not into me. It could be that I'm. 10 years younger than him and then a woman and that he was going to work for his probably friend DP and now it's me. Oh, yeah. But anyway, like he just gave me so much trouble on a day to day basis. Like we would start the day, we'd go, okay, we'd have some kind of incident and I would need to like confront him. Like, are we going to be able to get through today? Like, is, is everything okay? And this would happen time and time again. By the end of the movie, he would just not get out of his van and I would take lights myself. Oh my God. I would go light the scene. 
and it was it was truly terrible oh my god chloe first of all how could you not love chloe but second of all what did did you confront him like i mean it's really oh yes yes and, and and like this is a small crew it's him and i, I and i'm even like forgetting i think i had him who owns all the gear i had his friend who was doing the grip side who was nice to me mm -hmm. but was also you know a friend of his so I had to kind of like pretend like he was being mean but would still do whatever i needed because he understood that there was no reason to not like I'm their boss on this movie and they've agreed to do it and they're being paid and there's no reason not to. So anyway, um, I would, I would kind of get around this gaffer by using his two other people, mm. but they would kind of like work slowly for me and like allegiance to him. It was just like this terrible situation. And so I ended up, I mean, I'm happy with the lighting in the movie amazingly because so often I would not have his help at all. And there were some outdoor scenes like where you're not lighting as much and it's more of a grips role to help you light. Like he would just not even arrive at work. It was unreal. So what I learned, uh, first of all, I had to keep my cool. I mean, it really hurt my feelings every single day. It hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. And I would have to just like approach him like a professional and speak to him like a professional. Try to work it out, but get through it. And then what I've learned in retrospect is that I would just like literally never put myself through that ever again. Mm -hmm. I would just fire him. I would find some other gear. I would just do it a different way. I would never take the same amount of like abuse from day to day on a project that is really imperative to your career that you care about. And when you have no fault in like the reason it's going wrong. So it was a good exercise in like getting through something difficult and like managing to stay professional throughout. But it also taught me like you don't need to tolerate something like that again no you don't okay we have four questions <laughs> um let's see one of them from that sabara says how do you marker or brand yourself as an dp in order to get a position on set can you read it again sure how do you brand yourself as a dp in order to get a position or a job on set sure um i th the way i'm interpreting the question is like um how do i market myself basically um that's a great question i think i think i market myself using instagram i think i market myself um every day that i'm working and i try to just um have a good disposition like for instance when i was working for a man I, it was really important to me that we become friends as well like the success of working with you is the fact that we've continued a friendship to me that means that like that went well mm -hmm. and i think that i'm trying to foster that all the time it's like really really critical to be uh a likable uh person that has like some dimension like our relationship needed to have a dimension beyond just professionalism right it mm -hmm. needs to like mm -hmm. transcend that into like some kind of personal um relationship as well so i think that's something that i strive to do is to like create a thread that is like beyond the work it's there's something more there so like that's something that you do when you're in person on set with someone else and on set with everybody because i've gotten jobs from the sound person where you'd never think that would come from but like it's just important that your demeanor and the way you treat others like across departments the way you answer a phone the way you answer your emails like they're all um I guess just portraying your best self and especially when it comes you're always going to have conflicts and it's really important the way you conduct yourself when you're having a conflict or like a money conversation which are all things that dps have to like constantly be doing and they're really difficult and like sometimes your language is just really important or just like your calmness or um you need to show flexibility while also being strong and like not settling for something less than you needed. You know, you kind of have to protect your art while also being a nice person. And uh, beyond that, like, I don't know that I do, I don't, I'm not a super active Instagrammer. Other people are way better at that. And I notice them and I think that they do a great job, but like, I guess my main sources of marketing is like my personal relationship to you when I'm in front of you. And then, you know, people spread the word. That's well, yeah, I think it's huge word of mouth because you got I, you got the job from me and the job from Limerence from someone that spoke highly of you. 
And you know, it's something, I mean, these are other questions I want to get to too, but something that is really strong about you, Chloe, and I don't know if it's because of your experience from working in the industry for 10 years, is that there's no way our film would have succeeded without you. It would have just completely failed. And you, with all everything raining down on us at all times, with most features, but I felt like it was tremendous with ours, which was a traumatic experience every day of my life, you always were able to rein it in and be like, this is what we're going to shoot. This is what we're going to do. How are we going to do it? And every single day, even though we started four days late, trucks were late, whatever, you were always able to do that. Did that come from just your your calmness and ability to, to, to put it through? That come from your experience from being on so many different sets? I guess it probably does, yeah. I mean, having worked up the ladder in the camera department, because I haven't even told all the stories. Like, I've loaded film, I've stuck an AC, I've done so, I've done all the things, right? So you understand what every other person is going through on the set. Um, it's really created empathy for me, you know, and just thinking of other people's experiences. Um, I think it does come from just years and years of like, you know, the problems on our set, it wasn't the first time I'd seen those problems. Mm -hmm. It's like I'd even anticipated them because right. it, I've worked on a bunch of low budget stuff and like, oh, here's the thing that we knew would happen. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it wasn't like a total shock to me. And um, what could we do except for calmly decide what we're going to shoot because we have a camera and, you know, let's do this. I don't know. I guess that I guess that's the answer. OK, cool. Um, Daniela asks, did you feel outcasted while working with a male dominated cast from Chef's Table? If so, how? That's a great question. Let's see. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm in a unique position because I grew up with just all best friend boys. And I was like a little tomboy, wanted to be a boy myself. So I think that I have um, a unique way of being one of the boys i didn't i don't personally have um a difficult time with that and and um it's often something that i don't notice until it's pointed out to me like you're the only woman here you know like it's not something that i'm spending a lot of time thinking about because i genuinely feel comfortable around boys but um i think those are also you know those were friends of mine and so i've been on other sets where maybe i'm not picking you know, to, I don't know, I guess maybe older men have given me that feeling of like out, outcastedness. I've had some evil experiences with like another film where I was like, I, I had, um, this might be a tangent, but I had my biggest film as a focus puller, um, Julia Roberts movie. And like, um, I'm in charge of focus on Julia Roberts and she would tell Edge for it and a bunch of other stars. And my B camera focus puller, who's a veteran boy that I was hoping to learn from, he's a man. <laughs> um, he'd been in the industry, you know, 30 years longer than me, but he's working for me as my second focus puller. He was just like evil to me all the time. And I think it was an age thing. Like we just fundamentally grew up in a different era of filmmaking. I grew up with like wireless fo focus pulling. And he was on the barrel next to the lens with the old school follow focus all the time. And our methods were different and our outcomes were the same. The picture was in focus. I do it this way. I grew up this way with this is the modern te not technology that we're using. And he did it this way and he didn't respect my choices. And like, I think there's a far different way to uh, deal with that, especially when I'm your superior anyway, and there's still a level of respect that you need. But um, so I, I think that like really my only negative experiences when feeling outcasted are with generally like older men. Okay, yeah, no, that's, and that's unfortunate. You always handle it super well. Okay, so we have so many other questions. Um, all right. How do you, Sophia asked, how do you think the industry will look after everything's taken off hold from the COVID pandemic? Man, I wish I knew. Um, it's so interesting. Excuse me. Um, I, you know, I thought that the entertainment industry would be like immune to any issues like this, mm -hmm. like, because who doesn't stop needing entertainment? You know what I mean? Like I really thought there would be nothing to ever slow us down, but then here we are, like what we do as filmmakers are we're, we're in groups and we travel places. Mm -hmm. 
we're screwed, right? Like <laughs> we're the ultimate threat of like what is negative to do right now. So um, that's a really excellent question. I think that people will just have this, I mean, the whole, all of humanity will change. And I think all of the way, like the, the way we think of hygiene, the way we think of um, passing germs, like all this stuff is going to change. But like the reality of it is like, grips still are going to hand c-stands to each other and everyone touches everything and the camera operator is using you know the pan handle and then we say hey move the camera over there and then the camera system has to pick up all those same elements so like we're gonna just have to find a way to share our uh spaces again and i think that there will be a successful way to do that i think you know we've gotten over things like really serious flus before there there have been obstacles like this that resolve themselves over time but i think that like it wouldn't be bad if all of us as a whole had more control of our hygiene had more courtesy to others took genuine days off when we were sick you know things that we don't do like especially in the film industry mm -hmm. like we don't take days off we feel too indispensable mm -hmm. And it's not accurate, but you're made to feel that way. And certainly as a DP, if you're the DP of the TV show, you can't not show up for a day. Right. It's not the same as being the second AC or someone who you could replace yourself like fairly seamlessly. Like we have to have more leniency for someone like a DP to replace himself for a day. That's like the only way that we'll be able to do a good job moving forward. Nice. Um, Ryan asks, do you think working as a woman in film that it's been harder to make a name for yourself or that you really need to prove and set yourself apart? Was it a big advantage working with a small crew? Um, I definitely think that it's um, harder to set yourself apart. I mean, you have your feminism to set yourself apart. You have your the fact that you are a woman. I feel like in some ways that's made jobs easier to acquire now, now especially now that it's on everyone's radar right like a man ought, disqualified all men from shooting our movie <laughs> so i was instantly more qualified which is great and that happens sometimes to an advantage but i think overall yes it's really difficult to stand out um like if we're talking about big movies like if i'm you know as a cinematographer of course i want to aspire to like shoot a big movie like Marvel is not the example of the type of movie that I necessarily want to shoot, but like that shows the scope of something that I, I mean, I would eventually want to tackle. Now are a lot of women being qualified for Marvel movies? Not really. Just one. I mean, we have a recent example yeah. of Rachel Morrison, which is amazing, but like how long did that take her to achieve? And like, she's the first ever. So it's just, um, women like her that are um, setting a new bar for what is possible for us all. And yeah, we, we have to just um, continue to stand out with our, with our work and not our sex. I think that's an important thing for us to remember. Yes. Um, and that's something that she's doing. That's someone, I think every woman cinematographer is trying to do that exact thing. Like we don't love being called female cinematographers. It doesn't really insult me because I understand, I understand it. Uh, but I think we'd all just prefer to be cinematographers right, that aren't being compared to a man cinematographer, just like our work is what we, we hope represents us. Right. Great answer. Okay. So Maria asks, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for joining Maria. What's a regular work day like? What would you say are the pros and cons of being a DP and how are projects you're working on right now working around the virus? So actually this is a good question because this is one something I want to talk to you about, which we had discussed before a regular work day like is, you are never home when you're constantly traveling, right? So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, uh, a film uh, set, a uh, normal day is 12 hours, right? So if your call time, meaning the time that you begin work is 7 a.m., then you have an hour lunch break that doesn't count towards 12 hours, then you leave at 8 p.m., so 7 to 8. That's your, that's your whole day. That's like well beyond a normal eight-hour work day, right? But that's what we like in the film industry for a lot of practical reasons. Like we want to be shooting when the sun rises and we want to use all the daylight and then we probably want to tag a little night scene and then we want to go home. 
And then, you know, you want to stick to a schedule like that. And it often has everything to do with light and everything to do with just like budgets and like, oh, this set is like a million dollars a day. So like we can't afford to go home early or, you know, things like that, all these pressures. So you're dealing with a 12 hour day, generally speaking, unless you're in France and then it's eight and we're all envious of that. Uh, and some are 10, like when you're working on commercials, like a really smart person would just do commercials because they're less hours and more pay. But like a lot of us who love art and storytelling are gonna be on the longer uh, hours doing narrative work. So um, you report at call time. If it's at seven, you should probably be on set by 6.30 right? Especially if you're like a crew member, you want to arrive early. So that's added to your day. Um, and you'll work from the second that you get there to the second that you leave. There'll be great craft service provided to you and all the comforts of water and food and things like that. But, um, but yeah, you'll work your tail off for that amount of time. And um, if you're you know, that's like if you're on a TV show or something where you're reporting to like a studio or like a same location every day. Otherwise, like if you're working on a movie or a documentary, for instance, like you'll report to a new place every day. That's pretty interesting, right? Like, for instance, where I live in LA is like really irrelevant. Like I'm not driving to the same location more than once a week. Like I'm, I, so I'm reporting somewhere new every single day and at a new call time every day. It's like you have to be this nomadic person who doesn't rely on a on a um predictable schedule everything is determined by like the time you ended your last day right so if you ended your last day at eight you need to take a 12 hour turnaround that that is mostly for actors it allows actors to rest themselves for 12 hours and then they can call you at eight the next day and so as your week progresses you get later and later every single day. And generally by Friday, you're shooting like mostly a night scene or night scenes. And that goes into a long evening, like maybe you'll do all your night work. And then suddenly you're working something that we call a, a, a fratter day, which is like really when Friday goes into Saturday <laughs> and kind of ruins your weekend. And that's what it genuinely looks like to work on like a television show. Mm. You know, like your hours are nuts and you get paid handsomely, like don't get me wrong. Uh, and I think that's the reason that the pay is so genuinely good is because you're sacrificing so much other stuff and you just have to love it. Right. So and that's something that a lot of people do not understand when they look at the film industry. Um, you know, many of my professors from film school, they were either single, divorced, or have no children. Like there was no life outside of just a career, which which caveats me to you. You were yeah. traveling for like, what was the longest time, like a year? And you are married and you are currently pregnant. Yay, look at your pregnancy no time for happening. <laughs> and so, you know, what, <laughs> you wanna show us? What is this going to look like? Uh, right. Um... Yeah, I would, I would say that uh, two years ago, I spent my longest time away. It was like, we have, I'm married and I have a calendar here at home where my husband likes to highlight the time I'm gone, okay? This is, this is um, you know, like a kind of a way for me to understand how much of the calendar year I'm agreeing to be elsewhere. Mm. And so he's got highlighter on two thirds of the calendar. Mm -hmm. And what, um, if it weren't for that highlighter, I wouldn't notice the way it totals up because to me, I'm just, I'm just chasing these opportunities. I'm just like, so into every job that I've taken. And if they take me to another state, that's cool. And if they take me to another country, that's cool. I'm so engaged the time I don't care about. You know, but to my husband who loses his partner for all that time, it feels really different. So it was like, um, you know, we've been married for four years and then the calendar came out <laughs> at year, uh, I guess at year four. So like he'd been enduring the traveling like very sweetly. And then I was suddenly traveling two thirds of the year and he was like, hey, this is a problem. Have you seen the calendar? You're gone a lot can we change this? Like, this isn't really working. And so we had to have a really serious conversation because like, for me, I'm like, Hey, this is my time. We don't have a child work for women is exploding. 
I feel like I'm taking off. Like, how can I say no to any of these jobs? Like, if I tell you about each of them, they're each going to have this like great reason why like I needed to say yes. And he's not in disagreement, but he's, but he's like, you know, he needs to be a part of the decision and he wasn't always. And, and that was like something we had to resolve. But anyway, so after, after the year that I had traveled so much, I, I intentionally, you know, made, I tried very desperately to like find some more work in LA. I mean, I live in LA after all, I should be able to work in my town and it's harder than you think, especially when like I get documentary jobs. Well, guess what? Not a lot of documentaries care about what's happening in LA. It's like, it's somewhere else that the interesting thing is happening. So, I mean, that goes for movies too. Like if you're going to shoot the Star Wars movie, it's not going to be in LA. It's going to be probably in Belgium or something like, and you just have to, you know, if you want it and it would be an enormous opportunity for you, you got to just like sacrifice what your husband thinks and go do it or like come to terms with it, you know, like figure out maybe he's coming with you or, you know, you need a really solid partner and you need a really solid way of uh, discussing them and like kind of coming to mutual agreement on the things that you're going to take because yeah. they can be very lucrative, which is great for you as a couple, but they can also just like totally divide you, divorce you. Like it could be awful. And now that I'm about to have a child, which it really is true, it's coming, it's only eight weeks away. Um, I mean, that's when it's going to get really serious for me because now I'm the mother and can the mother be gone going to Belgium? I don't know. I, I'm going to have to reevaluate this whole thing because I really felt, um, I, I still felt like leaving my husband was an option, like he'll be fine, but leaving a baby is going to be a whole different scenario and it's going to change my whole life. I can't wait to see it. And you're going to be a great mother. <laughs> so we got four minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask this uh, question here. How are you staying creative during this lockdown? Um, great question. I, I mean, I kind of have this like interesting um, situation where I'm going to be a mom soon and I'm going to be taking some time off anyway. So um, I've been less focused on uh, figuring out what work is coming next because I'm literally not going to go back to work come June anyway. So I'm in a, I'm in a bit of a scenario where like it's been okay for me to kick back a little bit and like nest and do other things outside of cinematography. But what, what I will say is um, I've been working on my reel because it's very important to keep my reel up to snuff and I never do a good job of it. Like it's one of the hardest things for me to change and like uh, update and same with my website, like, but it's also imperative. So, um, you know, the room that I'm sitting in just behind this computer, there's like 48 hard drives and I've been organizing them. And as soon as they're organized, I will edit a new reel, I think, I hope. I'm really, I intend to do that. And that's what a lot of cinematographers are doing in their time at home, is they're making their reel better. They're making what their website better. They're posting on Instagram. They're using this time to like go back in their archives, color some photos, mm -hmm. and share that. You know, the other thing I have going for me is that I am supposed to shoot a feature still to this day in May because I'm very ambitious and I planned to shoot a feature with this big old pregnant stomach in May and it's still slated to happen. We're waiting to know, is it gonna, you know, when can we get back to work? It might just disappear, which would be fine. But you know, like you're still, I'm still getting calls for work. I still return the calls for work, even though I know I have a baby on the way. I want to talk to the producer. I want to meet them. I want to say how interested I am. I want to share my ideas. Maybe the project will push for six months and I'll still get to do it. Like I just still follow every lead and I still try to meet with directors and like I still push my brand, I suppose, like on a daily basis. And we'll just see what happens. All right, amazing. Chloe, <laughs> <laughs> of course you would shoot a movie nine months pregnant. Your water it. is gonna break on set and you're gonna Maybe. be like carrying the camera, move the light yeah. over here, let's go. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. Uh, two minutes left, one last question. Tiffany Franco asks, any advice on networking with other filmmakers and professionals in the industry? Um, yes, I would say that if there's someone that you want to talk to, 
Um, this is an era unlike any other. It's pretty easy to talk to them. So reach out. It's, you know, uh, from my own perspective, there's a lot of DPs that I respect and love and I write comments on their Instagram photos and sometimes they'll write back to me and that's pretty magical. Like, it really is. It feels like you can touch them and that you are their friend, even though, you know, they don't know you at all. That's been really inspirational for me. I would encourage you to do that. And also people write to me all the time. I have no idea how they got my email, but they'll ask me a question about camera assisting. They'll ask me a question about lighting. I will do my best to answer them. And I think that you, I think that any cinematographer would do the same, especially now, because what else are they doing? They'll take a break from editing their reel and they'll talk to you and you can maybe get an answer or two that you wanted. Um, don't be afraid of like just attacking because that's what it's going to take to be noticed. Like it's really important to be noticed and be persistent because DPs or other working professionals, directors, they get flooded with people writing to them. But if you're the one who persists and if you're the one who has something to offer, like you'll get noticed. All right, great. Okay, Chloe, thank you so much. That was so amazing. Woo! Thank uh, you for paying attention, everyone. I appreciate it. Yes, for sure. So that ends our first uh, Women in the Art series. Tune in next Wednesday at 4 p.m. where we'll be talking to Lee Lu, who is also a television um, and film director and documentary and narrative director. Thanks for tuning in, guys. See you later. Thanks again, Chloe. Mwah. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.